Welcome everybody. It's good to see people together again. Um, uh, we're extremely excited about this conference we've put together here. It's been a, a big team effort um, and extremely excited to have Walter Yanni joining us tonight. We have his pre-recorded video we're going to play here right now and then he's standing by online to take any questions and I think many of us in the room today have heard of Walter. Walter is an internationally known Australian soil microbiologist and climate scientist and the founder of Healthy Soils Australia. He's a passion, he is passionate about educating farmers, policymakers, and others about the soil carbon sponge and its crucial role in reversing and mitigating climate change. His work shows how we can safely cool the climate by repairing our disrupted hydrological cycles. That project requires us to return some of the excess carbon in the atmosphere to the soil where it belongs. In 2017, he participated in an invitation-only United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization conference in Paris, aimed at bringing soil into the next intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC report. As a research scientist at the CSIRO, Australian Scientific Research Organization, Walter investigated the potential of mycorrhizae fungi to recolonize toxic degraded soils and to rebuild productive biosystems. Yeni travels widely to share his understanding of the causes and solutions to climate change. So with that, we'll head straight into the video. If the, the crew wants to switch that over and sit back and enjoy. This is the opening address to the Manitoba Forage and Grasslands Association Conference in Manitoba, 16th of November, 2021. It's by Walter Yainer from Regenerate Earth. And tonight we want to talk about ecological grazing imperatives the decade ahead. And it's really to have an overview context of where grazing is going in the future, the challenges that we've got, and in a sense, the options we've got to address it. So greetings and thank you very much for your kind invitation to explore some of the experiences, solutions and questions grazing in Australia, globally, and you, of course, in Manitoba exploring to meet this global grazing challenge. While I am from down under Australia and thus not aware of more specific details, we face very similar strategic challenges in managing our grasslands and the production of food from them. Hopefully our experiences in addressing these challenges may be of value to you in your decisions for your future. By way of background, I am not a grazier, but a soil microbiologist that for 50 years has worked directly with soils, agricultural innovation and farmers. Initially as a scientist researching soil microbial ecologies to enhance the sustained nutrition and health of the forests and tropical crops and pastures. And then for the last 20 years, working with very innovative farmers in Australia and globally to enhance the health, hydrology, resilience and regeneration of agroecosystems that our future will depend on. This work has involved exploring practical strategies to help soils and agriculture adapt to and survive the intensifying dangerous hydrological extremes that we and I imagine you are experiencing. Strategies to reduce and sequester carbon emissions, avoid <laughs> methane liabilities, and safely and naturally cool biosystems and the climate hydrologically. Strategies to regenerate and rehydrate regions by enhancing the Earth's soil carbon sponge, in soil reservoirs, resilience, buffering, and productivity. Strategies to optimize the microbial ecology of soils and herbivore intestines to restore the nutritional integrity 
of our food and its preventative health values. Strategies to regenerate and rehydrate degraded, often arid landscapes. So I hope these discussions are value to you and I look forward to your questions on them, either after the talk or subsequently in electronic interchanges. However, in this talk, I want to set the scene for why and how these grazing ecologies and their soil and hydrological solutions matter critically into the future. To explore the realities and challenges grazing and we must face and some of the options we have to address them. Grasslands, herbivores and graziers are fundamental in securing these biosystems and humanity's safe future through them. So let's explore why and how this matters. And of course, we start with our 2022 reality. Where are we at from a demand perspective? There are now 8 billion of us on Earth. Some 10 billion are projected by 2050. We all need to and like to eat daily. 80% of us will live in cities. So the question is, how do we supply our adequate food needs in these environments? While we can afford to, while we can produce this food, the question is, can we sustain it? Will we be able to access and afford it? Will its nutritional integrity be adequate to meet our preventative health needs. And most importantly, as there are seven missed meals that separate social stability and chaos, how do we ensure that we avoid the risk of that chaos? In terms of our reality from an economic supply perspective, the questions become, can grass, can our grassland to produce most of our energy and protein foods sustain these demands and avoid the social instability if we can't supply them? Can our grasslands continue to do this despite our warmer climate with increased hydrological extremes, be they floods, frost, drought, aridity, or wildfires. Can we do this not just physically, but viably as the seasons become less reliable? In Australia, we're having really serious crisis because whereas we used to get reliable seasons nine years out of 10, it's often down to four years out of 10 or less. And of course, that's really threatening the viability, the economic of viability of the farmers dependent on that. Can farmers remain viable with this uncertainty and avoid debt and insolvency? Can they do this receiving the less than 10 cents in the dollar they currently do from their commodities? And then the question becomes, what can farmers do to survive in this new ecological and economic reality? Because business as usual is clearly not sustainable. From a strategic perspective, we also need to see where we've come to in our grazing management and grassland management. Pollen analyses confirm that 8,000 years ago, most of the 14 billion hectares of ice-free land, land, ice land on Earth was vegetated and had stable, humid climates in the Holocene. Our clearing, cropping, overgrazing since then has turned 5 billion hectares of this some 40% into man-made desert and wasteland. 
We've also created a warmer, drier, less reliable climate. We have degraded half of our current farm soils and we are oxidizing from five to 10 tons per hectare per annum of legacy carbon from them. This is degrading their structure, productivity and resilience. Globally, we lose 24 billion tons of topsoil per annum from erosion from our agricultural activities. Clearly, this is not sustainable. Business as usual that causes degradation has to be changed. Agriculture is becoming non-viable in many regions. Millions of farmers, such as in Syria, have walked off their land in the Fertile Crescent and into poverty due to the degradation of their once highly productive fertile lands. We need to look at what's causing this and how do we avoid this? How do we avoid joining 20 former failed civilizations that are now observable only in the dust of deserts and archaeology? Can we prevent this in our residual 1.5 billion hectares of cropland and 4 billion hectares of grazing land? What do we have to do to avoid what President Roosevelt warned us, a nation that destroys its soil, destroys itself? All these questions actually are focusing now on really the reality and perhaps our biggest challenge, our regeneration imperative. Clearly, as business as usual and its systemic degradation and desertification of our residual soil is neither sustainable, viable, or able to feed the 10 billion, we need to change. Instead, we need to actively regenerate, enhance, not just sustain the health and productivity of our soils. Fortunately, as in nature, we can do this practically by regenerating their structure, water holding capacity, biofertility, resilience and productivity. As in nature, we can do this simply and rapidly by A, maximizing the fixation of CO2 from the air by, into plant biomass by photosynthesis. But then the critical thing is, what do we do with every gram of biomass that this photosynthesis has resulted in? Only two things can happen to that biomass. It can either oxidize back to CO2 by fire, microbial digestion, and our oxidative land management practices. Alternatively, it can be turned microbially and biosequestered into stable soil carbon. And it's this question of whether we are oxidizing the carbon that photosynthesis gives us or whether we're turning it into stable soil carbon, which is really the crux of our regenerative imperative, but also our opportunity. While agriculture has excelled at growing plants, uh, a recent oxidative industrial practices and inputs have maximized its conversion into CO2. Regenerative agriculture, by contrast, minimizes this oxidation and enables over half of the carbon fixed by plants to be converted into stable soil carbon. This then progressively improves the carbon content and the productivity of the soil. Every gram of extra carbon that we can biosequester into soil can greatly enhance the productivity of that soil by a range of positive 
natural feedback multipliers. These increase the water infiltration, retention and supply capacity of those soils and thereby plant growth. They expose more mineral surface areas and thereby the availability of nutrients and the biofertility of those soils. They enhance the aeration and the ability for roots to proliferate to depth and in doing so access far, far greater dimensional soil resources. They enhance the microbial ecology in those soils and the role of those microbes in nutrient cycling and disease controls. They develop the organic matter content of the soils and the capacity of that organic matter to buffer chemical and hydrological extremes. And all these benefits and multiply effects available without needing to add anything to the soil except biomass and the microbial ecologies that convert that biomass into stable soil carbon. These dividends from the positive multiply effects from the increase in soil can carbon can enable natural soils to progressively increase their bioproductivity and nutrient cycles without the need for added nutrient inputs. This enables regenerative agriculture to enhance and sustain higher yields with lower inputs, provided the waste from the harvested biomass is returned to that soil for its microbial recycling. So it's a win, win, win. Just as in nature, these pedogenesis processes can rapidly increase the carbon content, structure, health, and productivity of, for example, of soils, for example, in producing the very productive prairie soils from glacial chills in the past 9,000 years that you, of course, have in North America. Regenerative farmers globally can and are using these same processes to do that in their soils. In doing so, they consistently biosequester up to 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum into the soils. Extended globally, this enables us to biosequester and draw down some 20 billion tonnes of carbon per annum globally. This is more than our fossil fuel emissions of 8 billion tonnes of carbon per year and could get us to negative net emissions by 2030 if we chose to do so. Practical extension of these pedogenesis processes could rapidly regenerate our soils and degraded grasslands and then enable them to sustainably secure the food needs and social stability of the projected 10 billion. While such practical actions to draw down carbon can regenerate soil, as in nature, their really valuable significance is in fact in restoring the Earth's terrestrial hydrology and this is actually a powerful consequence of soil regeneration so the issue is yes we need to get carbon into soils but that's not enough it's about rebuilding the earth's terrestrial hydrology because these natural hydrological processes are fundamental in that they govern all life on the planet its productivity extent ecosystem services and our survival. They, these hydrological processes also govern some 95% of the heat dynamics, balance and thus climate of the blue planet. They govern our capacity to regenerate biosystems and safely cool the climate in time. 
These processes can only operate, however, if there is water. And it's only our regeneration of the Earth's soil carbon sponges, as we've explained before, that is able to make that water available for these hydrological processes. So they go hand in hand. It's a soil carbon sponge, its regeneration that empowers us and nature to now have the water for these hydrological cooling processes. Science has long confirmed that the Earth's heat balance and climate, including the greenhouse effect, is regulated by a balance of hydrological processes that naturally either warm, cool, and buffer local and the global climate. We can greatly influence these warming and cooling processes by altering the balance of these natural hydrological effects. For example, we can alter the transpiration of water by plants, and this has a powerful cooling effect. Every gram of water that is transpired needs some 590 calories of heat energy to turn from liquid to gas. That energy has to come from that surface and thereby cools it significantly. We have got agency and can influence the production of haze micronuclei. These are critical in forming humid hazes that can both warm and aridify our climate. We can influence these hazes through, in a sense, not producing the dust and particulate aerosols that are nucleating these hazes. We can also govern the production of hygroscopic precipitation nuclei. These coalesce these haze micro droplets into cloud droplets and clouds. And of course, these clouds are fundamental in cooling the regions below them through reflecting incident solar radiation back to space. We can coalesce these cloud droplets to form raindrops and in a sense remove that water from the air. That water in the air is actually the key dominant greenhouse gas, of it, gas. And so by removing it, we can actually significantly reduce that greenhouse gas effect. By removing that water from the air, we can also open radiation windows, which enable heat to re-radiate back out to space, again, significantly cooling the climate. This hydrological cycle and this, this hydrological cycle has enormous wider influences because it increases the area and longevity of green plant cover and of course it's transpiration cooling effect. By covering these soils with plants, we greatly reduce the exposure and heat absorption of those soils and thereby the rise in their temperature. By reducing the temperature in these soils, we can massively decrease the re-radiation of heat by these soils. This is simple black body radiator physics. But what's significant is it's the amount of re-radiation from these soils that is in fact the driver of the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect being, of course, the amount of heat re-radiated by the planet and then the percentage of that heat absorbed by greenhouse gases. Clearly, if we're not re-radiating as much heat, there's not as much heat for the gases to absorb. Thereby, we can actually turn down the greenhouse effect, not just by reducing CO2 concentrations, not just by reducing water vapor levels in the air, but by actually reducing the amount of re-radiation from the earth by cooling 
and maintaining cooler soil temperatures. By reducing this re-radiation of heat from our soils, we can also reduce the formation of high pressure heat domes over these areas. Now, these high pressure heat domes, of course, are fundamentally important, but also deleterious in the sense that they block cool, moist, low pressure air from flowing into these regions. So many of our drought effects, the systemic drought effects of large regions, many of our monsoonal rainfalls are actually governed by these high pressure heat domes and their blocking effects on these cool, moist air inflows. We have agency over these processes and effects by our land management. We can cause them to safely and naturally cool regions and the climate in time. While science has long confirmed how these processes govern the climate, our narrow focus on the CO2 rise, the symptom from our land degradation, has masked the reality from these far more dominant hydrological processes. And the opportunity, the power that we now have, but also the imperatives, imperative is how do we harness these hydrological processes, how do we understand and manage them through our land management to safely and naturally cool the planet. We have less than a decade to do this, to avoid the collapse of key biosystems. Dangerous hydrological climate extremes are already impacting most regions. You've had it in Canada with your recent wildfires. We, of course, experienced that very well. So these things are intensifying, and really it's only by addressing these hydrological determinants of our climate, do we now have any chance for managing and avoiding these risks? Only urgent local grassroots regenerative action can now minimize these. This makes you the world's graziers and land managers with the experience, the land, the practical agents to affect these changes at scale and in time, the most critical agents we have to secure our safe future. Grasslands and you matter not just because of this role, but also in a sense, if we understand what grasslands are in their evolution and how critical they are to our future food needs. Grasslands, in fact, evolved relatively recently as pioneer plants, as an interface between, in a sense, vegetated areas and deserts. And they were able to do that due to their unique ability to colonize very challenging, bare and seasonally dry or cold habitats, habitats that trees and other vegetation couldn't survive. Grasses were able to do this by their capacity to grow very quickly, opportunistically, when conditions were good, and then hibernate, hibernate drawing nutrients back into their root bases when harsh conditions occurred. Also, by sequestering very significant ton amounts of carbon in their soils, the grasses were able to buffer hydrological and climate extremes and then improve soils to extend their growth and survival. It's these abilities that enabled grasses to serve as a front line of life between these bare ex in these bare extreme sites and progressively moderate them for subsequent plant successions. The downside of this, of course, 
was that in dry period, this profuse biomass above ground was excellent fire fuel, which made these grasslands highly vulnerable to fire. And of course, with fire, their oxidation and return back to bare mineral dead deserts. The evolution of symbioses with herbivores, however, enabled grasslands, grasslands to overcome these risks as these mobile biodigesters were able to eat that fuel and bioconvert them directly into fertilizers to further enhance grass growth and soil productivities. These grassland herbivore symbioses were fundamental as nature's agents and frontline tools in separating living productive biosystems and deserts and enabling life to colonize, to progressively colonize and into these marginal landscapes and seasonal stressed environments. And as we said before, this enabled 14 billion hectares, all the land on this planet, effectively to be vegetated naturally 8,000 years ago. Our sustained management of our grazing ecologies now play the same role. You know, we are the agents. We are responsible, but also we have responsibility via our herb herbivore management to do this. And in doing so, deliver the food, the hydrology, the natural safe cooling, and the secure future we all depend on. Given the critical role of our grassland herbivore symbiosis at the front line between life and desertification and our stewardship of them, we need to really give very high priority to any threats that could risk and risk these biosystems. While climate change and its systematic eridification and wildfires are major threats that have intensified the above natural options that we've discussed, soil carbon sponges, hydrology and natural cooling can potentially avoid them. However, far more serious and of our own making are recent corporate threats to market manufactured meat as an industrial alternative to the sustained production of grass-fed protein foods. This corporate sellout of the traditional markets and supply chains for pasture-raised meat products risks the viability of much of our current grazing industry and thus, thus the sustained ecological health of the grasslands it is based on. Without reliable, viable markets for the current supply of natural protein from grass-fed herbivores, the risk is that large areas may become destocked or not managed, resulting in fuels accumulating and wildfires. Conversely, it risks non-managed areas becoming overstocked. Both of these are serious in that they can rapidly degrade and desertify our residual grasslands. The social and ecological and climate impacts and costs of these this degradation will be immense. So we have to do everything we can to actually reinforce and sustain our ecological grazing management of these grasslands. While it may be financially and strategically beneficial for the corporate investment interest to promote manufactured meat, 
It transfers all their externalized liabilities, impacts and costs from their current farming operations to the public. And of course, these externalities, liabilities and costs will have to be met by the public. So it's really a very, very um, costly and damaging transfer of responsibility and liabilities to the taxpayers. Also not costed into this equation is the cost and consequences of the collapse of our ecological grasslands. Now, what would it cost humanity if we didn't have these grasslands, if they reverted to desert? What would be the ecological, the climate, the food insecurity, the social instability costs? Much of the marketing case to gain consumer acceptance of manufactured meat at the expense of animal-based protein foods has been and will be based on the false claim that natural meats of the false claim of natural meat high carbon and thus climate footprint while the reality is that ruminants as with all animals produce methane in their anaerobic digestion of food and while it's clear that that methane is a greenhouse gas there's been some very serious false reporting, misleading reporting on its consequences. It follows that the ecological grazing industry needs to address this reality and these false claims about their sector, as well as differentiate themselves from the industrial concentrated animal farming, the CAFOs, that certainly do have major methane emissions and liabilities and effectively no solutions under their business as usual model to address them. Given the false methane claims that are and will be used against ecological grazing by the corporate manufactured meat proponents to mislead, to, to mislead and capture consumers, we need to examine and promote the scientific reality about these methane emissions. While this can lead responses to negate the false methane claims, we need a much more detailed strategy based on verified evidence to address and to re promote the ecological raising industry and communicate and defend its valid case. So what's some of the key issues in terms of methane, the false claims about methane and the contribution of ecological farming? While climate change is real, serious and needs to be addressed urgently, and while methane is a greenhouse gas that is produced by most, most animals, including cattle and sheep grazing natural grassland, major false claims have been made about this methane production and its climate consequences. While they have and can substantially, while they have and can be substantially verified to be false, as they are now being used to, vil to vilify the grazing industry and mislead consumers on their animal protein consumptions in favour of industrial meats, it is critical that the public and policy interests are aware of the scientific reality and this misinformation. Certainly most grazing herbivores produce methane as they digest plants. Depending on the type of biomass and gut microbiology, some 2 to 20% of the plant intake may be converted into and emitted as methane. For cattle, this may average 1 kilogram per animal per day. Proportionally, of course, termites have much, much higher rates, but of course they're also much smaller. 
collectively a far, more, far larger contributor. Globally, some 600 million megatons of methane is produced annually. That's 10 to the 12th tons of methane per annum. Some 10% of this methane is being produced by herbivores. That's all herbivores. So grazing animals on grasslands are actually a small part of that 10%. Other major sources include fugitive gas emissions, emissions from oil extractions and coal mines, landfills, swamps, rice paddies, fires, soil respiration, and some geological emissions from volcanoes. Historically, methane production from herbivores and wetlands are likely to be much larger, even though the industrial sources may have been lower. Despite these former much higher methane emissions, methane levels in the atmosphere have naturally remained stable at very low trace levels of some 700 parts per billion. This stable and very low level, despite these former high natural methane emissions, effectively proves that there must be a highly effective natural process that rapidly removes methane from the air. Science has long verified this to be the case. Indeed, some 90% of the methane emitted from all sources is rapidly, naturally oxidized into CO2 by hydroxyl ions in the air. These hydroxyl ions are continually produced as water vapor is photo-oxidized by sunlight in the air, generating these hydroxyl ions. These hydroxyl ions are also responsible for oxidizing vast quantities of carbon particulates, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and pollutants from the air. They are effectively the air's natural laundry or cleanup mechanism. While there is normally adequate water vapor and sunlight to sustain the production of these hydroxyl ions, Methane levels may rise above large sources of emissions, such as in heavy polluted smoggy regions or where water vapor fluxes have been impeded. Recently, global methane levels have risen abnormally, initially to some 1,400 parts per billion, and then this last, century, last decade to some 2,600 parts per billion associated largely with fugitive gas emissions. High local emissions are also common from concentrated animal farms and their sewage part ones, as well as from some mines and industrial processes. There is no evidence that the numbers of herbivores feeding on grasslands or their emissions have increased, nor that they are significant in this overall global methane production and production and sink process or production and degradation processes. Despite this, and the minor methane emissions grazing in contrast to CAFOs are producing, the public have looked at grazing animals generically as being a source of emission and thus negative climate impacts. While it's difficult to quantify grazing cattle by, by sustaining pastures rather than letting them burn and desertify, often contribute to water vapor in the air and thus the production of hydroxyl ion 
at a far higher level than what is needed to oxidize the minor emissions from the herbivores maintaining these pastures. Given that a cow may sustain two hectares of pasture that transpires up to 10,000 litres per hectare per day, the hydroxyl ion production from this transpired water could more than oxidise the one kilogram of methane that cow would produce in that day. Given this 1 to 20,000 ratio of methane to transpiration and hydroxyl ion production potential, such herbivores may be key agents in producing negative net emissions. This may be critically important as climates warm and the 15,000 billion tonnes of carbon in frozen methane hydrates and tundras is increasingly emitted. Unless rapidly oxidised, such emissions would trigger a mass extinction of life on Earth. Paradoxically, the production of hydroxyl ions from high latitude pastures maintained by herbivores that are currently vilified for their methane emissions may be the only chance to avoid such global mass methane extinction. Let's hope this does not have to be tested. But let's also stop vilifying grazing herbivores as major sources of methane and using this and false accounting to penalize their graziers so as to promote genetically engineered manufactured meat. Their valid carbon cycle accounting would further reinforce the fallacy of their manufactured meat climate claims. So in concluding, while there's a lot of more detail to explore, I hope the above overview has reinforced how important and valuable sustaining our grasslands, their symbiotic herbivores and grazing ecologies are to our well-being and future. How important they are in meeting the food needs and social stability of the projected 10 billion, in regenerating our soils hydrology and landscape in safely and naturally cooling climates hydrologically and in time and in preventing and reversing the desertification of at-risk regions. Also, how important these grazing ecologies are in avoiding the threat of a corporate market takeover by manufactured meat and how important they are in responding to the false claims and vilification of grazing due to its natural methane emissions. As in nature, we now have agency by our wise management of our grassland and the force multipliers that we've discussed from rebuilding the Earth's soil carbon sponge to regenerate the biosystems we depend on for our future. While we certainly have created 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland, over 40% of the planet's land area, by former agricultural and overgrazing, we now have the tools to also regenerate this land to restore its health, hydrology and ability to support us. We can do this by our wise management and regeneration of ecological grazing. Innovative leaders like yourselves are doing this. I hope this has helped you in that journey. And I thank you very much and wish you all the very best for your conference and your journey ahead. Thank you. Do we have... Uh... Can you guys hear me, first of all? Yeah.
Okay. Can we do we have Walter's mic live into the room here now? Hello, yes. I will say, can you hear me, Walter? Just give a thumbs up. I can, I can, I can hear you, yes. I can hear okay. you. I can see images of different people. We're still so. struggling to hear you for a second here. Okay. I guess, so how we're going to work this, we have microphones on the floor here. I have a couple of questions online. Um, if you want to step up to the mic to pose your question, we will... The plan is to patch that in and it will be relayed to Walter online here if we can um, get, his, get, get him unmuted. Uh, okay, yes. Well, I'm, you can hear me, can't you? <laughs> Bear with us here. I apologize. Yeah. No, 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 it, troubles, no troubles. It's one thing to do it all live. It's another thing to do it all online, and it's a whole other ball game to intermingle the two. So we're. Uh, I I uh, there's a question. Can I see the chat? Okay. But yeah. No, they're the online. They can hear okay. all of us. We're just trying to get okay. Walter's okay. Yeah. Walter's sound patched into the room. So yeah. I think we're okay. getting there. <clears throat> can try talking there again, Walter. Can we? Yes. We'll check can you hear see? me? Testing. Testing. Um, okay. Is it coming through. I think we have found a solution. Um, I'll open the floor here. First of all, thank you very much for that, Walter. I appreciate everybody's patience. Hey, Walter, great chat. Uh, much appreciated. So I got like seven questions, but I'm going to narrow it down to two. And of course, there's like three questions in each question. So hopefully <laughs> you can answer. Uh, my first question is uh, uh, technology and grazing. Um, there's lots of talk, uh, I mean, now, and we're hearing lots about uh, GPS controlled uh, grazing, so we can keep animals tighter together and move yep. them more often. I'm wondering uh, what role you think that plays in the future, um, right? If we're, uh, you know, working with borrowed time, is this an option you see as something that's viable in the future? Um, and I guess I'm probably going to go sit down because my beer is getting warm. But uh, okay. I, so my second question is, and it's inspired by uh, uh, John Kemp's podcast, which I'm sure lots of people in this room are familiar with, where if you had a magic wand right now in your hand and could change the management practices of all of agriculture, so that's everyone grows cover crops or everyone rotational grazes or everyone stops glyphosate or tills, what would it be? So just, so just to rehash my okay, question. Well, look uh, technology and grazing, and if you had a magic wand tomorrow, right. what farming practice would you change right now? Thank you. I look forward to the response. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Look, firstly, the question about technology and grazing is is not it's a non no problems. It's really just going back to nature, and of course, nature, as we know, under holistic management, what have you. They concentrated the animals through carnivores, you know, threats of carnivores. And so the animals were concentrated and, of course, they were nomadic. They moved on. And the critical thing from that is that pastures were able to rest and recover and then rebuild their productivity from that in that rest period. And, of course, we can actually just duplicate that very much through electronics and technology. The issue isn't the technology or the carnivores. The issue is actually giving the pastures rest. So it doesn't matter what the mechanism is we use, what the tool we use, whether we use carnivores or technology, the bottom line is are the pastures getting the rest? A grass will grow. It will then come, become mature. Once it's mature, it becomes a fire risk. And so to stop it becoming that fire risk and becoming moribund, the best thing is to biodigest it, to turn it through a herbivore, back into biofertilizer, stable soil carbon and protein, and then allow that pasture to regrow. And it's that sequence of grazing and regrowth through rest that we've got to maximize. And yes, we can use whatever tools, fencing, electronics or carnivores to do that. The second question about what would I do in agriculture is of course much, much bigger. But no, the most important thing there is actually not me, but how do we empower 
farmers and graziers throughout the world, that they are actually the stewards of this land. How do we help them with the information that, yes, this is, these are the natural processes through which nature runs our soil health, its hydrology, its biofertility, and then all the other derivatives like cooling of the climate from that. And so how do we actually empower those farmers and graziers with that information and then the means to extend these practices globally? And I suppose one of the big issues there is how do we pay them fairly? And so this is perhaps the big sociological crunch. Farmers, graziers are now getting less than 10 cents in the dollar for the commodities they're producing. At the same time, we are basically paying through the nose exorbitantly for the preventative health and the disease consequences of our degraded food systems. So how do we actually bring those two things together, pay farmers more so they can grow better nutritional integrity food so that they can actually manage those biosystems and we can achieve our health values. So how do we bring farmers and the community better together around the health of that food, uh, rather than having the food industry dominate the whole game, giving farmers a 10 cents or less than 10 cents in the dollar for commodities, and of course, the population suffering from its ill health effects. So really, it's a matter of social empowerment. We have all the knowledge, the skills. We've got really leading innovative farmers all over the world demonstrating, yes, we can do this, but I suppose it's just the pricing and that social uh, corporate management of the system that has to be changed so that farmers get paid properly and that also the society values the nutritional integrity, the health value of its food, and it goes direct to farmers to source it to avoid those disease consequences. Okay, you, thanks, Walter. Yeah. Um, I've got a question online here. Um, yes. To bring it back to the technical, you mentioned stable soil carbon several times in your talk, and again now, yes. can you just expand on that? Define how, what do you consider stable okay. soil carbon? Yeah, very important. Thank you so much. And I went through that briefly when I talked about A, B, and C. Obviously, the first thing is photosynthesis producing, fixing carbon, CO2 and water with sunlight, making biomass, you know, sugars, cellulose, lignin, biomass. And of course, that's not stable. And then the question is, what happens to that biomass that's produced? And most of it or can actually oxidize through fire or bad or oxidative agricultural practices. But the critical thing is to make it into stable soil carbon. And to do that, there's really basically one simple process. It's microbes, mainly fungi, converting that biomass in the soils, polymerizing it into humus, and that's creating then humus compounds, very large, long-chain compounds, and these are stable for 100 to 1,000 years. So it's a microbial conversion of biomass into these humus, polymerized humus compounds. And there's another pathway, which is actually uh, mycorrhizal fungi, again, fungi. So both of these are fungal dominated. Here are fungi, mycorrhizal fungi that are taking sugars, at root exudates from the plant, up to 40% of the carbon fixed, and turning it into glucosamine, which is again a, a carbon compound, to make their cell walls. And as they grow throughout the soils, proliferate through the soils, they leave behind these cell walls, and these cell walls actually then again are converted into a compound called glomalin, and it again, it is then stable in soils for 100 plus years. So there's two main avenues, a higher fungi turning biomass into humus, and then the mycorrhizal fungi turning root exudates basically into glucosamine and then glomalin to make chemically very, very stable soil compounds. Okay, 
Excellent. Um, another question that's come in kind of online and it's it's been on my mind as well. You mentioned 10,000, or sorry, 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year is what you're seeing yes. as uh, potential carbon sequestration. Um, uh, now, there are people in Australia that are getting paid for carbon sequestration, as I understand it right now. Um, I know on our farm here, I think Blaine Jurdis, he, he took some measurements and I, I had it figured to maybe we're running around three um, yep. tons per hectare, if I did the math conversion correctly. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and the yep. value of that? Like in Canada, we are currently paying a carbon tax of $40 per ton CO2 equivalent, which I, if you do the math on 10 tons per hectare, I think it's like $600 and yep, acre, it, it, if it's, I did it correctly, yeah, it's, it's a, a huge changer. number. So it's a go game ahead changer. and uh, I would like totally. to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, no, look, very important. Okay, so now what we said is up to 10 tonnes per hectare per annum, and there's no question that the innovative regenerative farmers in Australia are doing that, and the same, of course, in North America, the Gay Browns are above that 10 tonnes, the Dave Johnsons, etc. So there's no question here the innovators doing that. And it's, again, quite simple. It comes back to that ABC that I talked about. When you think of, okay, how much biomass can we produce above ground through photosynthesis, through plant growth? We grow sugar cane and it produces up to 200 tonnes of biomass per hectare per annum above ground. So 10 tonnes is nothing, right? That's 200. And then the question is how much of that biomass above ground plus the equivalent biomass below ground, which we normally don't consider, the roots, which are about 30% of the biomass, and the root exudates, which are an additional 30 to 40% of the exudates. See, it's all that biomass below ground down, up, down under. And then the question of how much of that is oxidized. So if you've got just say a pasture that's doing five tons per hectare of per annum, you know, of carbon fixation, you've got another five tons below ground. And then the question is, how much of that do you oxidize back to CO2? Even if you're doing three tons, yeah, that's progress. And you'll find that as you go along, it gets better and better. Your rates go up because it's basically the soil microbial ecology, the fungal activity improves, and more and more of that biomass carbon can be then sequestered. As far as the value of this carbon, yes, it's very powerful. As we get, we will have to have carbon accounting globally, obviously, and if and when there is a valid commercial carbon price and trading, which is slowly happening after the Paris 2015 COP21 meeting, and now COP26, although they haven't come to the agreement and standards quite as they should. The point is, as that carbon accounting comes in, then farmers should be getting paid for the carbon they're sequestering. And yes, if it's in the order of, you know, 20, 30, $40 per ton, this becomes a very, very significant part of their income. But let's be honest about it. This is actually rebuilding the Earth's natural capital. This is the soil capital of the planet, which we've been, in a sense, oxidizing and mining. That's why CO2 has gone up globally, not fossil fuels. Most of it was from oxidation carbon from biosystems. And it's that carbon that we need to restore back into the sponge to rebuild the hydrology, to be, rebuild the stable climate. So while there's some money to be made and make and enable farmers to be viable, it's really a much, much more important thing. This is reinvesting in regenerating the earth, regenerating the hydrology, regenerating stability, and it's really what we need to do for our future. So carbon sequestration, critically important to build the sponge, to rebuild hydrology, to rebuild farmer viability, but also to rebuild a stable climate and planet for the future. Okay, excellent. 
Do we have any more questions from the floor here that anybody wants to get in on the action? I, there is another question in the chat here. Yeah, um, please. In the meantime, if anybody wants to head to a mic, go for it. Um, what is your opinion on different soil amendments, biochar, the Johnson Sioux compost, things like that? Is, is that worth the time and um, investment? Look, uh, or yeah. is it a distraction from just good grazing management? Uh, okay, look, uh, no, there's no plus or minus. I mean, it's not one or the other. What we come back to the processes again, we've just explained that ABC. And now the question is what's limiting the carbon uh, biosequestration, you know, the formation of stable soil carbon. And it may be that like the fungal activities that drive this are being impeded or inhibited. And so then the question is, can we stimulate those processes through, for example, biostimulants and amendments to accelerate those processes? And yes, that works very, very well. And so that, you know, like we have to look at a system, we have to read and say, look, what is limiting the optimum carbon fixation? And then how do we actually re-stimulate that? But there's a big difference between re-stimulating natural systems in the soil, switching them back on, rather than us trying to add carbon. So for example, biochar, where we're really taking biomass, we're pyrolysizing it, you know, like in a sense, burning it to have charcoal, and then we're putting that charcoal back in the soil. That's a very, very um, carbon expensive way and energy expensive way of doing it. The best way is to always let nature fix the carbon through photosynthesis and then enhance these microbial processes to maximize fungal biosequestration of carbon in soil, turning biomass into these humates and glomerulant forms. Hello? Okay, I'm just looking. Uh, we've got another question in the, in the chat here. I'm just trying to read it here. Um, this is a question in the in the online. Recent science and technology progress in China allows the use of CO2 to synthesize to for synthesis of starch in laboratory and use CO2 and ammonia to produce proteins, which will be yep. far more efficient than growing crops in fields. What do you think about this progress? and how it will um, impact the future of agriculture. Okay, look, uh, this is, uh, thank you for the question. And it's a little bit like the manufactured meat story. So I think it's really important to do that. We've basically had 420 million years of evolution on land. You know, this is plants evolving. And of course, nature has spent that 420 million years naturally selecting, refining, and perfecting photosynthesis on land, right? Photosynthesis has been going on for 3.5 billion years in the oceans from blue-green algae. But just on land, so we've had that perfection. And, and certainly, basically, the conversion of CO2 and water and sunlight into sugars through photosynthesis is, is highly effective, not because it's the most uh, highest rate of production, it doesn't need to be, none of those things are limiting, but in terms of the energy efficiency, because we're actually getting that for nothing, right? Sunlight is free and there's nature doing this sequestration. It's also doing it over basically initially 14 billion hectares of land on this planet, but we've desertified 5 billion hectares, so we've only got about eight left, right? But the point is, it's actually, the question now comes, how do we actually optimize this carbon drawdown, carbon sequestration food production? And the question is, can we actually regenerate more of the land? Can we let plants grow for longer, better, because we're taking away the limiting factors? And can we actually then 
and power and enhance biomass fixation and food production globally that way? Or conversely, can we go into a laboratory? And certainly we have these technical means of doing things, but what is the embodied energy cost? How much energy cost is there in doing that? And then, of course, even if we're doing it, where do we get the materials from to do it with? We still have to grow those materials and produce those materials. And let's use the example of manufactured meat, right? We've got sunlight and CO2 and water producing basically plants which produce grasslands. We've got herbivores naturally turning that grassland into protein and biofertilizers. And effectively, we can manage that basically that very high value protein as our food source. Conversely, what we can do, we can say, yes, here we can grow now these proteins in tissue culture. We can make manufactured meat. But to do that, we're going to have to supply, in a sense, a lot of amino acids and a lot of sugars and a lot of other inputs to grow, to culture that meat. And of course, those amino acids and those sugars then have to come from crop production in high intensity crop production. And so if you look at the overall energy efficiency of it, ecological grazing and producing protein from grassland is a hundredfold more productive if you looked at the full carbon and the full energy accounting compared to doing it artificially in a laboratory. If we then go to these artificial foods, you know, whether it's protein or these other food sugars, see, the question is their nutritional integrity is totally compromised. Whereas nature provides us with some 50 essential nutrients from the soils that we are absolutely critically dependent on for our preventative health. We have got no way of providing us with those nutritional complexities, balances, ratios through these artificial produced foods. And in a sense, we then suffer because we end up with these chronic exponentially rising diseases because of the lack of nutritional integrity in our food. So we're cheating ourselves in terms of the whole energy accounting, we're cheating ourselves in terms of the input accounting, and we're cheating ourselves in terms of the health consequences of these artificial foods. And I think if we had proper accounting, by all means, nothing wrong with science, nothing wrong with innovation, but let's look at the metrics, let's do the accounting properly, and we find that nature beats them hands down every time. Okay, excellent. It all boils down to the energy intensity, and we need to reduce our fossil fuel use, and the easiest way to do that is to rely on the natural processes that are already extremely efficient. So Totally, totally. You. See, the point the I'm going to... I've got one more question here, and then I think we yep. will we'll wrap okay. it up unless somebody jumps up to the mic here. In your, all of your travels, Walter, and you've visited with a lot of groups, different conferences, organizations like this, what would you have, say is the most effective or what, what do you think is the most effective means to give people the push or to help farmers, ranchers adopt these regenerative techniques what is what are you seeing there as being the most effective okay, okay. strategy well, look, to help adopt change okay and this comes back to that last point we were making you see it's it's a basically it's the energy cost nature has a better formula it, it gets much higher efficiency if we do proper counting and i think this comes back to this answering how do we actually what's needed to catalyze the change or what's limiting and we have all the look, we have all the tools, we have all the knowledge, we have all the science, there's no issue about that. Nature's demonstrated, yes, we can. Our lead innovative farmers have demonstrated, yes, we can. You know, yes, we can do this. But the point is at the moment in our economic system, because we are externalizing many, many of the input costs, we're certainly externally money you know, the consequences, the degrading consequences of it. So we've got a completely false accounting. And of course, you say, how do farmers actually change? Well, basically, they can't change unless the accounting changes, unless the actual real value 
of their products, what they're producing are valued in terms of health, soil restoration. So we've got to start putting natural capital, social capital, human health values, ecological restoration values, climate values. We've got to start putting those into the balance sheet. And then it becomes a no brainer. We have all the tools, we have all the mechanisms, and then our farmers and graziers who are stewards of those biosystems, those land systems can be viable and prosper. But until we actually value those things and while we discount them and externalize them, and while we just screw farmers down to less than 10 cents in the dollar for commodities, they can't, they can't make that system viable because it's designed not to be. It's designed to just sort of basically enslave and extract. And so what I'm getting at is it's really just re-empowering farmers through acknowledging these proper values for what they're actually producing, putting them on the balance sheet, and then the solutions become very self-apparent and all the technical means become available. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, I'd like to give you a huge thanks, a round of applause here. Really appreciate this, Walter. Thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure, and uh, all the very best for your conference as you're going forward. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody online and in the room here for bearing with us as, our, as we iron out the kinks with our technical difficulties, but I think it'll be smooth sailing from here on out. A um, couple of reminders. Um, Christelle and, and Andrea has been helping her a bit too. They've got the silent auction out back. Remember to hit that up. Um, the bar is open. If you stick around, this is what we're here for in person to network, visit, um, get caught up on what everybody's been up to in the last couple of years. Um, tomorrow morning, the breakfast is on your own. Uh, the hotel restaurant will, will be there for breakfast. Um, we'll get going here uh, around eight o'clock with opening remarks. And then uh, the first presentation will, will start about five after eight. So you're gonna wanna be in here ready to roll at eight o'clock. Um, we do, we're very much aware of the provincial health guidelines and we thank everybody for obeying those mass um, wristbands the hotel lobby has been distributing wristbands just so that uh, we know that everybody has has their vaccination credentials, whatever. Um, so we thank you for that. And yeah, we look forward to an exciting couple days here. Um, and thanks again, everybody tonight for coming on the opening night.